Daniel chapter 3 at verse 19. Through to the end of the chapter, hear the word of the Lord. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, the fur and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound, into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors, being gathered together, saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power. Nor was an hair of their heads singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. And please pray with me once more before we begin. Heavenly Father, we do not deserve to be here in your courts this morning. We don't deserve to have this wonderful time to fellowship with one another and to worship uh, our triune God. But we thank you that you have uh, given us far more than we deserve, that you've been gracious to us, that you've sent your son to die for our sins, to bring us into uh, resurrection life in him giving us your spirit, building us as your people into a holy temple um, for you. And so we pray, uh, as has been prayed already this morning, Lord, that you would conform us to the image of your son, uh, cause your word to go forth in power this morning, that it would be preached not by my power, but by the power of your spirit, uh, to the glory of your name, the edification of your people, and the salvation of those who are far off. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So continuing in Daniel, picking up where we left off in Daniel chapter 3, uh, God delights to bring resurrection life when the surety of death is at its greatest height. Again and again, this is the story that God loves to tell. And when these situations come about in history, right, when we talk about history, history is not this neutral playing field that's either, you know, not non-Christian or Christian. History is simply the recording of God's providence throughout time. Right, since creation began. And whenever these situations come about in history, they always come about as God's people are faithful to his word. God's people are not to go out and seek death in their own wisdom because God loves to bring resurrection life. And so let's just go seek out death so that they might be granted resurrection. Rather, God's people walk faithfully with him in accordance with his word. And in doing so, they're often confronted with death. Think of Abraham with Isaac. Think of Noah in the flood. Think of Joseph with his brothers. Think of the Israelites in Egypt. Think of Samson. On and on you could go. For us, even today, death comes to us. Right? Many of these stories are very grandiose. But death comes to us even now as our preferences are challenged. As our failures are made plain to us. And our desires are shown to be out of step with the word of God. Death comes to us when we're forced 
to humble ourselves and lay down our unbiblical desires and submit ourselves to God. That's a form of death. And such death, we have to admit, we have to recognize, sounds horrible to our flesh. Every time it sounds horrible to our flesh because death is not pleasant. It's not actually easy to grow in patience when push comes to shove. It's not easy to actually prefer the desires of your children above your own. It's not easy to listen to corrections. But as Christians, we have to recognize that death, when it's in accordance with the areas that Christ tells us to die, is the way to true life. This is the paradox of the Christian faith. If you want true life, you must die. Christ bids us come and die. And here we've just brought up a few small examples of what we must be willing to do, areas we must be willing to die, so that God might raise us up in the power of Christ's resurrection. We do not, again, seek death according to man's wisdom, but according to the word of God. Right? God tells us where we're to lay down our lives. A good example is Ephesians 5, verse 25. Paul says, husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Here is your model. Husbands are to lay down their lives as Christ did for the church. But what I want, us to, what I want to be clear from the start this morning is that such death, such laying down of one's life is not simply a morbid command from God, which must be obeyed. That's not how God's commands are to us, because God is good. So it's not just this morbid command to be obeyed to your own earthly suffering all your days. God tells you to die, and so go die and just deal with how horrible it's going to be all the time. No, we die to ourselves so that death might not reign. <laughs> We die to ourselves so that death might not reign. We die to ourselves so that we might have life more abundantly. Paul says in Galatians 2 verses 19 and 20, For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. That's not life, that's death. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The Christian life is one lived in the power of the resurrected Christ. It's a life of killing our flesh, killing the indwelling sin which remains in our flesh, but living a life of faith empowered by the spirit of the resurrected Jesus. And it's only through faithfulness to die in these small areas Right, patience, diligence in our labors, consistent sacrificial love for our families, prayer. That we'll be equipped to be faithful when greater forms of death may be required of us. Right, the person who's willing to jump, it says they're willing to jump in front of a bullet for their wife, might be telling the truth. Maybe they would step up in that moment. But the, the best litmus test for that is how they, how they handle uh, a difficult conversation, how they handle a conflict how they handle times where they need to be patient. That's where it really comes down to. Now, certainly our text this morning is one of the chief examples of one of these grandiose pictures of a willingness to die in faithfulness to God, really in all of the scriptures. Last week we saw, uh, what we saw was this unwavering courage, uh, or two weeks ago, but the last time we looked at this text, we saw this unwavering courage of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as they stood for truth, right? There's this horrible threat of death looming, a, a horrible death. Right, being cast into this fiery furnace, standing before them. And we saw that not only did they stand firm, right, but we saw in the, in the tenor of their response, they were so confident in God's faithfulness toward them that they spoke to the king in terms that pretty much everybody would say are inadvisable in terms of how to speak to a powerful king like Nebuchadnezzar. Not many people would counsel them to speak this way. Many would say that there's never a time to speak so freely and even apathetically, in a sense, to a powerful king like Nebuchadnezzar, especially with the threat that's on the line. But these three faithful Jews believed that Nebuchadnezzar's command to worship the golden image, which he had set up. And remember, we saw in the text that there was a big deal made about the fact that he set it up. right, Again and again and again, over and over in the text, it talks about Nebuchadnezzar setting it up. And so they believed that his command to worship this image, which he had set up, was just such an occasion to speak so apathetically and really flippantly to the king. These men knew that there was no man, no man on the earth that has ultimate authority. Only God possesses absolute authority, and he gives that authority as he wills to men on the earth. And so this wicked king Nebuchadnezzar, as we talked about last, uh, last time we looked at this text, had stepped far outside of his rightful lane in terms of the authority of a king. 
And therefore, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego felt free to rather flippantly disregard this command of false worship. Now, our text this week details the great power of God in comforting and defending his people. Our text shows the difference between those wicked and powerful men who consider themselves, right? What we have between Nebuchadnezzar and the true God here, it's this, it's this battle of the gods, and we've seen that throughout Daniel already, right? Nebuchadnezzar's, what's the picture here? He's the consuming fire, right? Well, is he the true consuming fire? No, he's not. And so what we see here is Nebuchadnezzar seeking to set himself up as God, and the text is going to be very clear that it's the utmost power That could be conjured up by the most powerful man on the earth. Set up against almighty God. Who will win the battle? That's our text this morning. And so we pick up again in verse 19. After the words of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So we're in the middle of this dialogue. Between Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Nebuchadnezzar. And they had said basically. No matter the physical circumstance. They said God is able to deliver us. Not a problem for God to be able to deliver us. But he may not. Either way, it it doesn't change our actions in the least. Either way, we're not going to worship this false image. We're going to worship the true God. Pretty straightforward. And so they're sticking to that path regardless of their physical circumstances. And that's what's presented uh, by them to Nebuchadnezzar for his response. Then Nebuchadnezzar, this is verse 19, was full of fury. And the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. Remember we saw last time we looked at the first half of Daniel 3. That Nebuchadnezzar had tried to give these men a second chance. They had disobeyed and he called them forward. Right, and Again it was that false picture of, of God. Right, His kindness meant to lead to repentance. He's like I'll give you a second chance here. I'll give you one more chance to to repent and to turn back to what I'm calling you to. Possibly he's just hoping to not have to throw anyone into the fiery furnace. Kind of puts a damper on what's supposed to be this joyful worship service that he's hosting here. Probably wanted to be a unifying experience for his kingdom. And yet his command was scoffed at by this bold minority. And so he's going to have to make an example of them. And so Nebuchadnezzar's countenance, we read, was changed dramatically in light of this, not just a a respectful disagreement, but an outright straightforward rejection of his command by these three Jewish men. Nebuchadnezzar again wanted his kindness to lead to repentance, but now his wrath has been kindled. And so we're seeing his attempt here to play God. He's demanding the worship uh, worship from these men for the image that he set up in front of the image that he set up. And we know that God alone is deserving of all worship. So he's trying to take the place of God and demanding this worship. And Nebuchadnezzar, again, is threatening his wrath via a burning in the, in the fiery furnace toward those who disobey his command. But again, God is the only one who is truly a consuming fire. Only God's holy wrath against disobedience is just. And he's the one who is Lord over the eternal fires of hell. We read that the furnace was heated seven times more than normal, right? Why do we have this figure here? Again, I think this is showing us the fullness of Nebuchadnezzar's wrath. Most powerful man on the earth at this time, undoubtedly, right? And his his wrath, which is signified by this fiery furnace, is heated seven times, right? A perfection of hatred, a perfection of his power, the fullness of his power being manifested. Nothing is being held back by Nebuchadnezzar in his punishment for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's everything he can put forward for them. Greatest possible wrath from the most powerful man on the earth. And this is again important for us to note. Because it shows us clearly that God is delivering these men. From the fullness of the great. Like the fullness of of wrath from the most powerful man on the earth. That's what God is delivering his people from. This is not some small act of deliverance. God in his providence is causing the stakes to be raised. Right? God is telling this story. And he's raising the stakes as high as he can. Let Nebuchadnezzar be the one giving them wrath. Let him be the one persecuting them, not just some other official in the land. And let, in front of all of his officers, all of his chiefs, let it be heated seven times more. God is making the picture look as grim as possible for these Jews. And this only continues in verse 20 and following. We read that he commanded the most mighty men, the most mighty men that were in his army, to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Not just anybody's going to bind these men. It's going to be the most mighty men in Nebuchadnezzar's army. 
in verse 21 and continuing, Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceeding hot, the flames of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound, into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. There's to be no mistaking whether this fire should have killed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's not left up to interpretation for us because three men who are apparently able to throw them in but not able to run away fast enough die from their proximity to the fire. So the question of whether or not this fire was really that hot, three men died from their proximity to it. And we read that they fall down into the midst of it, bound. Again, what story is God telling here? What are the chances that they're going to be able to make it out of this situation? What hope do they have? The fact that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into the fire clearly here with their uniforms on may point to a message Nebuchadnezzar was trying to send. We're not told explicitly. But if there was a message sent with that, it would be something along the lines of, it doesn't matter your rank or your position in this kingdom. If you disobey my command, you're going into the fire. Right? His power and his mind is universal. It's absolute. Your rank and prestige will burn with you, Nebuchadnezzar says, if you disobey my commands. Now, the dire situation of these three Jews is seen not only, in the, again, in the excessive heat of the fire, but in the fact that they're, they're thrown in while being completely tied up. They fall into the fire still bound. And so what hope, again, is there for these men as they're thrown into such a raging fire? Asked another way, what hope is there for these faithful Jews as they experience, again, the maximal amount of wrath from the most powerful man on the earth? What hope is there for them? Verse 24, then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, true, O king. And he answered and said, lo, I see four men loose walking into the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Now, this is a familiar story to many of us. Probably not the first sermon you've heard on it, but please do not brush past, brush over the glory of this story in your mind. This was an astounding event. An astounding event. It was not long after these men are cast into a burning fire with many witnesses that Nebuchadnezzar was startled out of his royal seat in the midst of this mock sanctuary that he's made at the sight of four men, not three, walking. He clarifies, he clarifies two things, right? He clarifies the number of men thrown in. Did not we throw three into the fire? Bound. Right? That's the second thing he clarifies. And were not they bound? Because both of those are not checking out at this point. Because not only do I not see three men, I see four. Not only are they not bound, they're loose, they're walking, and they look completely unharmed. Right? His eyes are seeing something contrary on both accounts. The fourth man, Nebuchadnezzar says, is like the son of God. Now, what, is, what does this mean? Now, the, you'll notice the translators of the King James Version uh, state their interpretation for you in the text. Right? They tell you plainly, in the, using the capitalization of the term son of God, to tell you who they think this is referring to. Now, this is certainly not, we have to understand, this is certainly not what Nebuchadnezzar means when he says the term. Right? To expect uh, an orthodox doctrine of the Trinity from a pagan king in the Old Testament is that's a ridiculous standard and i don't think you can prove that even a little bit uh so i don't think that's what nebuchadnezzar is saying at all uh it would make sense that nebuchadnezzar is saying much more like a term like son of the gods right he's understanding this is an angelic form he's not saying oh this is a christophany this is a an old testament uh manifestation of of the second person of the trinity that's not what he's saying now that might be the case i think that is the case of what we're seeing here but that's not what Nebuchadnezzar is saying here, and we need to understand that. And so Nebuchadnezzar sees this as an angelic figure. Certainly, uh, he's in Nebuchadnezzar's mind, a deity has that the, the deity that these men worship has sent a, his messenger to protect them. That's established. That's that's clear, right? But we do have examples for us as those who have our Bibles, have the Old and New Testament. We have examples throughout the Old Testament of appearances of the Son of God in visible form. While not every angel is a Christophany, this uh, manifestation, a physical manifestation of the Son of God, 
This is the case when we look often at something like the angel of the Lord. And we don't have time to do a, a full dissection of that this morning, but just a few texts that I think are helpful as we look at the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. We see from a few scriptural passages that this is clearly uh, more than just a messenger, uh, but is rather, uh, yes, certainly one sent from God, but also one who uh, receives worship. Right? Receives worship is seen as omniscient, all-knowing. Right? Attributes that belong to God alone are seen in the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. One example we see is when the Lord appears, the angel of the Lord appears to Hagar in the wilderness. This is in Genesis chapter 16. At verse 7, we read, And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain of the way, in the way of Shur, the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself unto her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, and it shall be... It shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man, and his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called, uh, she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here uh, looked after him that seeth me? Genesis 16, verses 7 through 13. So the angel of the Lord is referred to as God, referred to as all-knowing or omniscient. The angel of the Lord is identified as God again in Exodus chapter 3, right, in the, the burning bush before Moses. We read in Exodus 3 at verse 2, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, unto Moses, in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and See this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. And just one more text. The angel of the Lord appears as a man and receives worship from Joshua in Joshua chapter 5. Joshua 5 at verse 13, it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand and Joshua went unto him and said unto him, art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, I am now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, what saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, loose thy shoe from off thy foot, familiar language. For the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. So certainly these texts give us a picture of God being able to physically manifest himself to his servants. But how can we be confident that it's a manifestation of Christ and not say the Father or the Spirit? If someone was to pose that to you. Well to put it simply this is just how the Apostle Paul describes Christ to us. Colossians 1.15 says that Christ is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of every creature. The Apostle John adds that no man has seen the Father. John 1.18, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. The Son declares the Father. He is the image of the invisible God. Jesus himself concurs that no man has seen the Father. In John chapter 6, verse 46, he says, Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. And while we're not given such explicit statements in regard to the Spirit uh, not taking on physical form, right? We know the Spirit's able to do this at Christ's baptism in the form of a dove and at Pentecost in flames of fire. Uh, but we know that Christ is, again, as Paul said, the image of the invisible God. That's where we rest our case. It's the Son, the Word, who would later take on flesh and dwell among us. And so the possibility of this being the Son of God in human form is certainly possible. And I believe that such is the case. Now, could God have delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from this fiery furnace while using the help of another angel to do so? Yes, absolutely. Could God have done it with no angels in the narrative whatsoever? Absolutely. But regardless, typologically, right, when we look pointing forward, it actually isn't even dependent on whether this is the angel of the Lord or another angel to see the picture of what we're to see moving forward. What does it mean that there's this fourth man, like the Son of God, walking with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in these flames of judgment? Whether it's the angel of the Lord or not is actually, uh, typologically, it's not dependent on who it is. I think it's, there's a glory in seeing it as uh, the angel of the Lord, uh, but we'll return to that idea shortly. Let's look first at verses 26 and 27. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together, saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor is an hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Again, an astounding sight here. To see these men literally walk out of a fire completely unharmed, down to their smell. There's a great detail. Down to their smell. They are clean and preserved. In what looked like sure death. What could look like more sure death? God preserved these men such that they were completely unaffected. Down to the smell, completely unaffected. His wrath literally did absolutely nothing. Completely impotent. This is an impotent wrath from Nebuchadnezzar. Really, their clothes are fine? They don't even smell like fire? Look at the impotence of this wrath compared to God's ability to preserve his people. God not only delivers them, but by the presence of this fourth man, we see clearly that God walks with his people in the midst of their persecution. God's walking with his people in the midst of their persecution, in the midst of their suffering. And so again, however you take the passage, whether it was a, an angel sent from God to minister to these men in this moment or the angel of the Lord, God is ministering to his people. God is clearly ministering to his people. So much is undeniable. Nebuchadnezzar's wrath is fruitless against the servants of Jehovah. And it's precisely because Jehovah is with his people in their time of need. Protecting and preserving them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego pass therefore from death to life as Nebuchadnezzar commands them to come out of the fire that was supposed to bring about their sure destruction. Notice that they're identified by Nebuchadnezzar as the servants of the Most High God. Right, we're going to see again here, it's not full repentance. We're going to see very clearly it's not full repentance from Nebuchadnezzar at this point. There's a lot of humbling that has to happen in his life before that's going to be the case. But still, we see a, a, a degree of reverence for the true God in light of what's just an undeniable deliverance of the people of God right before his face and before the face of all of his officers. And so they're identified as servants of the Most High God. Remember that Nebuchadnezzar had just asked them earlier in the chapter, right? He asked them a question. When he put forward this command to them, he said, what God is going to be able to deliver you? Right? This is not a, this is not a stand worth taking, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because what God is there in all the world that's going to be able to literally deliver you from the flames of this fiery furnace? Right? Whatever you think of your God, you don't, you don't trust him that much. So let's just put this aside, okay? We've all, we've all got our people we worship, but this is a little too far. Just bow your knee and let's move on, right? But they refused to do so. And so the answer had come. What God can deliver you out of the flames of this fiery furnace? Apparently their God can. And so the answer had come, and again, it was plain, not only to Nebuchadnezzar, who was the Most High God, but to all his officials, to all who are witnessing this event. And so we pick up at verse 28, Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted him. Right? That's a good, a good blessing. It's a true statement. And have changed the king's word, absolutely, and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree. Still in charge, right? That every people, nation, and language, that, la that phrase should sound familiar to you. That every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their house shall be made a dunghill. That should sound familiar to you as well. Because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So remember from the conclusion of Daniel 2, Right, Nebuchadnezzar's wrath, just like we saw in Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar's wrath is again turned on its head. Right, remember in, in Daniel 2, there was this command given right, to, the, to all the wise men in Babylon. And he told them, if you can't tell me the dream and the interpretation of the dream, right, your houses are going to be made a dunghill. I'm going to lay you waste, turn your houses into a dunghill. Right, by the end of the chapter, he's blessing God, right, giving treasures to Daniel. As we'll see in Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar has not yet been humbled to the point of actually turning from his sin to worship the true God. But Nebuchadnezzar is still able to recognize 
what's before him, just an objective and an objectively glorious deliverance of these men. They were literally in a fire before his face, and he watched them walk out unharmed. Nebuchadnezzar is impressed with the dedication of these faithful Jews, and so he makes a decree similar to his own decree at the beginning of Daniel 2, like I just mentioned. Right, in Daniel 2, verse 5, he says, Then the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. So this is Nebuchadnezzar's favorite punishment to give. He's yearning to make houses dunghills. Now, after the deliverance of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these same threats are leveled against any who would speak ill of the God of the Jews. See what our God is able to do to the words of his enemies. He turns the hearts of kings as he wills. God turns the counsels of the ungodly on their head. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were going to be destroyed because they would not worship a God other than their God. That was the grounds for their punishment, them being thrown into the fiery furnace. And now they're being honored because they would not worship a God other than their God. And anyone who doesn't do likewise is going to be punished. Right? We read every people, nation, and language were called to worship the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up in the beginning of Daniel 3. Right? Nebuchadnezzar said, every people, nation, and language come and worship this golden image that I have set up. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to follow. Now every people, nation, and language must, must speak nothing evil of the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The reversals are numerous. Nebuchadnezzar, of course, we see, is clearly still seeing everything in terms of power dynamics, right? One way or another, in his mind, someone is being cut to pieces, someone's house is being made a dunghill. That's definitely happening. And so he still needs to learn more, right? Where does that fall short? What, why, what's wrong with that? Right? He still needs to learn more about the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He needs to realize that he's not automatically in the right just because he's king. And he's just got to align himself correctly and start punishing the right group of people. He needs to repent. <laughs> he's got his own problems. He stood opposed to this God. Right? That's his problem. Is it's not personal for him. He doesn't realize that he's a sinner. Right? He as king is not exempt from needing to humble himself before this God and bow his knee. He's got his own enmity with which he needs to deal with. And so there's still some logs to remove out of Nebuchadnezzar's eyes before he's going to see the true God repent and worship him rightly. But still, we see that the rank of these faithful Jews was not only maintained through the fire, right? their clothes are preserved, but that they were lifted up, promoted in the province of Babylon. We see clearly in this story that God protects his people. God protects his people. This is in accordance with God's promises. Right? We don't need to make up promises in God's word. We need to search God's word for his promises to us and rejoice in those. Right, people, All kinds of people call themselves Christians, seek the false promises, right? promises of health and wealth and prosperity and, and just lean into those with everything they have and rest themselves there. But we don't, we don't need to do that. There's glorious promises in the word of God that we are to rest ourselves on. And we see many fulfilled uh, for these men here. Just a couple examples, Isaiah 43, verse 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. God says, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Psalm 34, verse 7, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. We are to see such deliverances as the fruit of the faith, which God graciously gives his people. These deliverances are the fruit of the faith that God gives to his people. That's what we see throughout Hebrews 11. But our text is referenced in verses 33 and 34. Who through faith subdued kingdoms wrought righteousness. Right Through faith subdued kingdoms wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned, the flight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Although we could talk about many more passages, our security in God and even God's promise to protect us, as he did for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, using his angels, is summed up best, I think, in Psalm 91. So I'm going to read Psalm 91 now if you want to turn there. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. 
Surely he shall deliver me from the snail of the, foul, of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth, his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. Therefore shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt, be, thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, God says, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Psalm 91. Again, these promises are not sparse in the Bible. Not sparse in the Bible, not hard to find. Because these promises are right at the center point of the purpose of creation in the first place. God made this world so that he might redeem a people for himself. God made this world so that he might show his people his salvation. It's one of the main reasons we're here is so that God could show us his salvation to the praise of his glory. Thinking more about the one like the son of God who was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire, I simply want us to glory and end this morning by glorying in the picture being painted for us here in this epic story. God preserves his people. He preserved his people who were faithful to him from the greatest wrath that this world could offer in Nebuchadnezzar. What is a raging fire to the God who upholds all things, including the fire and the man who commanded it to be heated seven times hotter? Right, what is that to the God who upholds these men, upholds the fire by the word of his power? What are a few ropes to the God who actively sustains the molecules which make up those ropes? Man's wrath is a complete joke to God. There's not a man on this earth who can compete with Almighty God. Not one who can threaten God's people in a way that would make God sweat, so to speak. But even this deliverance, this glorious deliverance from the fiery furnace of Nebuchadnezzar, pales in comparison, infinitesimal in comparison, with the deliverance from the white-hot wrath of God, infinitely hotter than Nebuchadnezzar's maxed-out fiery furnace, from which we are delivered through faith in the Son of God. We can only be spared from the eternal wrath of Almighty God because Christ our Lord not only walked in the fire for us, but was burned up by wrath in that fire in our place. We can have forgiveness for our sins because God's anger for those sins was heaped upon Christ. He was punished in the fires of God's wrath, though he was perfect in every way. He was crushed under the hot rage of God's righteous judgment, though he knew no sin for all his days. And why? Why did Christ endure such hostility from sinners and such unimaginable judgment from his Father? Well, Jesus did so to redeem us from our sins. Jesus gave himself for us, for the church, so that he might sanctify and cleanse us by the washing of water with the word and present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish. Christ died so that the fiery furnace of God's wrath might be quenched. When Christ died and Christ did die, the fire of God's wrath toward his people was snuffed out. There was no wrath left, but mark well that it did require death. He did not just walk in the midst of the fire. He was crushed in that fire for us. Christ truly died in those flames and his body was put in a tomb. But Christ did not lay dead in that tomb forever. No, three days later he rose from the dead as victor over sin and death. The one who defeated death and who now lives forevermore. Right? He is ascended to the right hand of the Father. He is seated there as our high priest and as king, Lord over all the earth. 
receiving the nations as his inheritance. God could be with his people in the midst of this fire, and he can be with his people now in the midst of every trial, because he is the God who would one day, and who now has, taken on flesh, and endured the sufferings of the much greater fire of his own wrath, so that his people could be blessed. And remember that you are blessed in him, and that you're blessed for no other reason. You are blessed because God has been abundantly kind to you. And God has done so out of pure mercy and grace to undeserving sinners like us. And so here's what all this comes down to for us this morning. If God is your God, and if you're trusting in Christ, then he is your God. If God is your God, then despair is folly. Despair is folly. If God is your God, then gratitude is your duty. If God is your God, you are safe. You're protected. You have no need to give way to anxiety or to think that your life could make its way out of God's gracious provision for you. You're not capable of doing that because God is your God. In fact, if God is your God, you can walk joyfully into death. Not just physical death, but all the little ways that you're called to die each day. And so do so. Die to your need to always be right. Humble yourself in your work with your boss that frustrates you. Humble yourself in submission to your husband at home. Apologize for your frustration with your children. Rid yourself of those forms of entertainment which you feel so entitled to, but which consistently lead you into lust. Die to your flesh and live by faith. Follow God's word and know that every death, every death according to God's command by faith will result in resurrection life. God will bring more abundant life to you as you die to yourself. And so your duty, each of you, dear Christians, is to set your hope on the God who has promised to never leave you or forsake you. Hope in the God who sent his son into the furnace of his wrath for your sins so that you might stand before him in the same son's righteousness. Not even the smell of fire on the white robes which he will give you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your son. We deserve your wrath. We've broken your law. We've sinned against you. We've even continued to sin against you even after learning of the glories of the gospel, having our eyes open, the scales peeled back so that we might behold your glory in the face of Christ. And so we pray that you'd forgive us, Lord. We thank you for the sufficiency of your son and his sacrifice, that our our salvation, our reconciliation with you is not dependent upon our works. Uh, prior to coming to Christ, our works uh, after coming uh, to Christ, but that it rests in him alone uh, and to his glory, um, all of our salvation. And so Lord, we pray that you continue to conform us to his image. Help us to be a grateful people. Help us to trust your promises and to like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego by faith bring about your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We love you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.